All the meeting doors, please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call. Member Steele? Here. Member Lyon Walk? Here. Member Frederick? Here. Member Lambert? What? Member Holbrook? Here. Member Dean? Here. Member Lake? Here. Thank you. Next we have uh, presentations and program highlights from Hungerford Nichols. Are you Mr. Hungerford or Mr. Nichols? I am Mr. Budenberg. <laughs> <laughs> Great to be here, everybody. Thanks are for you, having me. Are you going to sign this report? No, Hungerford signed it. Uh, my boss signed it. Right. <laughs> they figured that out. So, uh, just to get started, thanks for having me tonight. Uh, I'm happy to go over the audit report with everybody today. My name is Taylor Boonenberg. I am an audit manager with Hungerford. Uh, I've been with them for about seven years now, and as well, this is my seventh year auditing the, uh, the Coldwater District. So, happy to be here. Um, today, we're going to cover the audit report. Uh, we'll keep things nice and brief, high level, and hopefully digestible for some of the non-accountants out there, even though I know everyone's been dying to hear this audit report, you know, all, all day. So. Uh, without further ado, we'll really get rolling into it. Um, for those of you sitting, uh, you should have about three binded copies in front of you. The bigger binded copy is the main audit report. That's the financial statements. Um, then there should be a smaller binded copy in there as well. That's the single audit. Um, and then as well, a letter. Uh, it's about three to four pages. It should be stapled together. Um, so that's kind of a letter to the Board of Education that we'll cover very briefly. Last thing. Um, but jumping right into it, right? Everyone's main question, how did we do on the audit? Um, so what I have to do is say we exclaimed an unmodified audit opinion. Now, what does unmodified mean, right? So that's essentially the highest level audit opinion you can get. It's that A-plus passing grade. It's, it's the, the highest level, again. It's the only thing that MD accepts as well. So it's what we strive for year after year, and it's what we give you know, here at the Cold Water District year after year with the good audits. Um, so very happy to say that, but in accounting language, right, what does it mean? It's the financial statements are presented fairly in all material respects and that they're in accordance with accounting principles generally accepted in the United States. Um, so but what do we mean by that, right? That the presentation, the transactions, how we're recording for that, how we're presenting with that is all in accordance with those general accounting principles, right? So we're not straying away from the norm there. Um, and as well, we do a, a review of your internal controls over financial reporting. So those checks and balances over, you know, how are those transactions processed? How are they recorded? Are they accurate? So on and so forth. Um, so we do a little bit of review on that uh, where we don't exclaim an opinion, but it all kind of goes up into that overall audit uh, opinion there. Uh, but happy to say no financial statement audit findings noted. So good things there. Um, and then the last big thing I want to hit on is no new accounting pronouncements this year. Uh, seems like every year that I've been with Hungerford, we'd have some sort of new accounting pronouncement, some new standards, some big update. Not only does that create a ton of work for us as your auditors, it creates a ton of work for your business office. Really, you know, understanding what is that new accounting pronouncement, does it relate to us, how does it impact the district, how do we need to respond to that, do we need to change some of our internal controls, so on and so forth. So, no new accounting pronouncements, love to say that, a little bit of reprieve is, is very nice for us and as well your business office staff, so great things there. Um, jumping right into it, um, so kind of switching back to June 30, 2024, at the end of the fiscal year, where did we end the fiscal year? Um, so a little look kind of at different fund types. Um, so we have the general fund, right, that primary operating fund. We have your special revenue fund, which consists of your food service fund, your child care, and your student school activity fund. The debt service funds include your 2018 debt and the QZAB debt fund, and then your capital projects funds, lastly, uh, for the balance sheet side of things, really just consists of your 2019 building and site sinking fund, which is that construction fund funded by those property tax millage dollars. Um, sticking with the general fund being that primary operating fund, as we end the year, total assets just over 15 and a half million, with total liabilities just over six. So a current ratio analysis there ending at about two, just over 2.5 for a current ratio. Uh, so pretty healthy there is those financial resources on hand, right, that are there. They're readily available to help pay for those current liabilities coming up as we move into fiscal year 25. Uh, special revenue, pretty, pretty, consider, pretty standard there with $1.3 in assets. Um, small, small liabilities there, generally consisting just of accounts payable. Um, as we look into the debt service fund, we have about $4.85 in total assets. That's largely just a cash balance on hand to help pay for those bond obligations, so those principal and interest payments coming due. 
And then lastly, our capital projects funds at about 1.45 million in assets. Again, generally just cash there, um, holding those property tax millage dollars to help pay for some construction, some remodels, some future projects coming up for the district. And a look, kind of sticking with the general fund, a uh, comparative look across the past four years, so 24 to 21. Uh, we have our revenues, our expenditures, uh, other financing sources, uses there, and then ultimately what is our net change in fund balance. Um, so if we imagine over to the right that there's a, a column there for fiscal year 2020, something big happened in 2020, right, the pandemic. It did create a, a lot of additional expenditures for the district, a lot of additional uh, obligations going on. And as well, what we saw with that was an increase in revenues from state school aid, from some federal sources, helping the district cover for those increases in expenditures. Um, and as we look year over year, you can see that trend, right? Expenditures going up with revenues going up to follow. Uh, looking down, other financing sources. Um, in the general fund, this is really going down as uses outweighing uh, those transfers out. So kind of spreading some money out, uh, particularly to that QZAB debt fund. Um, and helping pay for some resources and some of those other funds as well. And then lastly, our net change in fund balance. So past fiscal year, and as well the three preceding years, we've had a positive net change in fund balance. So going the right way, um, showing you know a good management of resources on hand really. So all trending in the right direction year over year. So things that we like to see as auditors. And going down into the revenues. So, you know, what are those sources of revenues coming up? What are those financial sources and, and where do those come from? How does it help us pay for things? Um, so just a visual representation here in the peach colored cell in the pie chart, we have our local sources. Uh, those consist mostly, mostly of your property tax dollars, your interest earnings. Uh, small, small sliver there, you can't even see the color. It's 0.1% for some non-educational entity sources. And then the big green portion of the pie, those state sources, so that's your state school aid. Pretty, pretty considerable for the district for sure. And pretty standard, floating around two-thirds of your, your total revenue sources for the general fund. So pretty typical, I'd say, based on all the various districts that we audit across the state. Um, so nothing really going on irregular there. Following in the pinkish purple cell, we have our federal sources, so those restricted federal grants, think Title I, uh, your child nutrition cluster, right, funding that lunch program, maybe your ESSER funds that came about after the pandemic. And then lastly, we have our inter-district sources, so any, you know, revenues that may come from shared services to other districts, uh, but more predominantly, those, those revenue sources coming from the ISD to help the district um, pay for those expenditures that come about. And similarly, we have another look at the expenditures by function. So, so where is all that money going to, right? Uh, so just above 55%, we have instruction. Um, pretty standard there, right? What are we here to do? We're, we're here to provide instruction to the kids. So nothing going on irregular there with that, that percentage breakout. Uh, then we have supporting services, just over 36%. Um, so, you know, a, a wide array of, array of supportive services by the district. Think of pupil services, general administrative, you know, you got your business services, transportation, so on and so forth. Um, so a pretty big makeup there. We have a small green sliver at 0.6% for community services. Um, and then in that pink cell, 76 for capital outlays. Um, we saw, you know, a, a good amount of projects being done at the district this past fiscal year and as well kind of finished this fiscal year. So that's really what's going on in that pink cell. Um, and then a small, small sliver for debt service. Uh, so paying on some of those capital leases, those copier leases that are incurred by the district at about 0.1%. And following that, uh, another visual kind of representation to look at the general fund fund balance, right? So what was that trend across the past five years that we're looking at? So starting in fiscal 2020, um, ticking up year over year really each year. So starting from that pandemic, seeing those additional revenue sources come about, and even with those additional obligations that those district incurs, we still are seeing a nice uptick in that fund balance for the general fund. Um, just over, you know, nine million as we end fiscal year 24. So really going in the right direction, things that we like to see there. Now jumping over to the single audit, uh, this would be the smaller binded copy in front of you. This is our, our federal compliance audit or our audit over those federal grant programs. So again, Title I, you know, nutrition, ESSER, so on and so forth. Uh, we, we do a little evaluation where we test, you know, each major program. So from any, any given year, it could be one to two programs. Um, generally not going over three just to get that level of coverage that is needed for the audit. Um, but we're happy to say we extend an unmodified opinion, again, for the compliance over each major program that we tested there. 
Within the single audit environment, we are required to do a deeper dive into internal controls, specifically over compliance. Um, and in this case, the Title I program, it, it brought about some payroll testing, and specifically those controls governing the payroll testing, right? That percentage of payroll charged to the program. In which case, we did result with an audit finding in internal controls over compliance, specifically, again, in the allowable costs area, um, really focusing, again, on payroll charge to the grant, where there was an excess amount of payroll charge for one particular person, um, as opposed to the supporting hours worked you know, out of the total week. And we'll, we'll get to that a little bit more here in a second. Um, but lastly, the, the schedule of expenditures of federal awards here, the SEVA, as it's dubbed, this is the statement in that smaller binded copy. So this is where you will see all your federal grant awards um, by award year, by title, you know, how much was spent on those awards, how much cash was received, and then at year end, what was the receivable on that award. And with that, uh, that, that statement there, that schedule is fairly stated in all material respects in relation to the financial statements. Um, so where we're auditing, you know, the major programs, where we're not necessarily auditing every single program, that kind of ties into that in relation to opinion there as far as the CFA compared to those financial statements that we covered in the beginning. Now a comparative look at the single audit from year to year. So in fiscal year 24, we had uh, 5,188,000 in total expenditures, where in fiscal year 23, we had just over 5.5 million. And this decrease here is, is really expected, um, and it's really, it's, it's focused more on the education stabilization fund, or the ESSER grants that you might be more familiar with. Um, with that, those, those grants kind of came about after the pandemic, those emergency related funding sources, those are starting to taper down now. And in fiscal year 25, uh, typically, you know, those won't be a type A program, and those won't be something we will audit just as they're going away. Um, really kind of spending is done after September 30 of 2024. So from year to year, a look at your type A programs. Uh, type A is any federal program that spends over 750000 in expenditures. Um, it's a threshold that we evaluate in the audit that goes into those major programs that we do test. So from year to year, the Education Stabilization Fund and the Child Nutrition Cluster were the, type, the two type A programs. Uh, so being your more considerable funds, right, it's a good thing to know as we look forward, you know, budgeting forecasts and then looking further into the, the next fiscal year, the next audit, right, what are those type A programs that we expect um, to be picked for an audit. As far as the major programs tested in fiscal 24 this past year, we had Title I and Education Stabilization Fund, those ESSER funds, and then fiscal 23, the year before, was just those ESSER funds. As far as the percentage of total federal expenditures tested with those major programs, fiscal 24 had about 53% in total federal expenditures covered by those two programs only. Where in 23, the ESSER funds uh, covered about 47%. Um, so it's really considerable, those ESSER grants, how much those are making up your federal awards and really how much that's gonna impact as the drives down in the next fiscal year as those ESSER funds go away. <coughs> Um, and then the audit findings, right, we kind of hit on this earlier, Title I, Part A, we have that finding surrounding allowable costs, cost principles. Uh, we worked with the business office to, to kind of evaluate that impact there. Um, ultimately, it was, it was adjusted against that final draw, so good things, no money taken back from, by MDE, um, so no big penalty like that. Uh, we did work with the business office to, to get a corrective action plan to respond to that finding and, and kind of build, bulk up those internal controls there, um, which we'll see at the back of that report. Um, and then fiscal 23, no audit findings that year. So just a little comparative breakout year to year and what to expect as we go into fiscal 25 for the single audit. Lastly, the letter to the Board of Education. This is the few pages stapled together. It's a letter format. Um, pretty typical part of an audit. It's a required piece of communication, so it's not a result of any issues or irregularities, any you know, disagreements, things like that. Um, this would go to show, you know, if we had any significant changes to the plan scope of our audit, um, if we had any disagreements or difficulties that we encountered during the audit, that would be there. Happy to say there was none. You know, no disagreements. It was, it was a pretty smooth audit overall, so happy about that. Um, and then the last thing to hit on on this letter is the general fund ending fund balance. So back to June 30, 2024, that general fund ending fund balance was about 24% of fiscal 25's budgeted expenditures. Um, it's a pretty solid percent there as we move into the next fiscal year. Um, for our standpoint as an auditor, it's a, it's a pretty good range there, um, but that provides some stable operating funds 
um, really, you know, a, a good financial resources on hand as you move into the next fiscal year and ultimately trying to avoid any need for short-term borrowing. So with that, I know it's a lot to cover in a short presentation. I know there's a ton of information in those financial reports. I'm um, happy to answer any questions now if anything popped up. But of course, if anything comes up after the fact, you know, please don't hesitate to get in contact with us. I'm always happy to answer any questions and help out. Uh, Mr. Budenberg, uh, at the very first slide you said it was an unmodified report. Yes, sir. In the past, it seems to me it was unqualified. Unmodified. They didn't use unqualified in the past? No, no, qualified is the bad opinion. That's the one you don't want. So no, it was unmodified no, un opinion. Unqualified. Unmodified. Okay. Yes, sir. <laughs> I looked through all of these and I can't find that language in any of them. So that's, that's the hard part about the language. It's an unmodified opinion, but it's not directly stated as unmodified. That kind of term, you know, the, the financial statements are presented free and fairly in all material respects. That's the, the unmodified wording. So somebody has to dig to get to the fact that it's unmodified. That or contact your auditors, you know, presentation like this where we're happy to, to kind of answer that, provide some insight there. Okay, and because your your job is so much easier this year, <laughs> is it going to cost us less? I, I wouldn't say so much easier. I would say it's a little more routine. No way. No. <laughs> I, you, that's what you said. Yeah. My job is going to be a lot easier this year. I, uh, I wish. <laughs> I knew. But no, working, working with Rochelle in the business office definitely makes it a pretty smooth audit, so big shout out there. Okay, thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you, pleasure to be here. Uh, principal appreciation recognition. So as, as October is uh, Principal Appreciation Month, and uh, if you didn't get your snacks, there are snacks here, but um, each year we like to also share the proclamation from the governor, and uh, so I'd like to read the official, the official proclamation for October 2024 Principals Month. Whereas energetic and inspiring school leadership is essential to Michigan schools in order to prepare students for success, both during their pre-K through 12 years and beyond, and whereas principals are entrusted with the educational development of young people and serve as educational visionaries, instructional leaders, assessment experts, community builders, facility managers, special programs administrators, and guardians of various legal, contractual, and policy mandates and initiatives. And whereas principals set the academic tone for their schools and work collaboratively with teachers and parents to develop and implement a clear mission high curriculum standards, and performance goals. And whereas principals play a vital role in the success of students by creating school environments that facilitate great teaching and learning, as well as continuous school improvement. And whereas principals make significant contributions to the success of pre-K through 12th grade students by acting as the liaison between the school and the community it serves, ensuring that parents in the community are aware of student and school achievements, and whereas the celebration of Principals Month honors elementary, middle, and high school principals and recognizes the importance of school leadership in ensuring every child has access to a high quality education. And whereas during this month, we join educators, parents, and students throughout Michigan to raise awareness of the importance of educational leadership and recognize and thank the hardworking principals in Michigan schools who set exemplary standards of service. Now, therefore, I, Gretchen Whitmer, Governor of Michigan, do hereby proclaim October 2024 as Principal Month in Michigan. And I personally would like to thank each and every one of you. Did they get their cookies now? Or? They could have them anytime. Anytime you can get up and from their <laughs> seats. It's your yeah. Anytime during the it's your this show. It's your meeting. So, okay, anytime during the show, you can get up and have a cookie. Uh, next, a request for a public participation form. Anybody wish to address the board? Seeing none. Uh, next, we have visitors, delegations, and communications. I assume none. I have a communication. Oh. Yes, I do. Good. Yeah. First one. 
Um, this is to the central office and the Board of Ed. It's from Holly Knuckle, who is our transportation supervisor, in regards to her husband passing away um, last month. I wanted to say thank you for all the love and support you have given my family, and I appreciate it more than you will ever know. The plan is awesome. As we try to navigate day by day, day, by day we know we are we are being supported, love, Holly and family. Thank you. Uh, next we have the approval of the minutes from September 23rd, 2024, the regular minutes and the closed session minutes. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Approval of the agenda additions or deletions, are there? Nope. So we have the consent agenda, communications, no, just the one you just read. Uh, personnel recommendations. Personnel recommendations, be it resolved that relative to certified staff recommendations, the Board of Education approved the administrative recommendation to employ Jamie Schwartz for the first grade teaching position at Max Larson Elementary, effective October 23, 2024. The Board of Education accept with regret the resignation of Samantha Epp, social worker at Max Larson Elementary, effective the end of the day on Friday, November 8, 2024. Relative to support staff recommendations, the Board of Education approved the administrative recommendation to employ Mr. Samuel Bernard uh, for the Haitian Creole Parent Liaison for Coldwater Community Schools, effective immediately upon board approval. The Board of Education approved the administrative recommendation to employ Cheyenne Logan for the part-time behavior support supervisor position at Max Larson Elementary, effective immediately upon board approval. The Board of Education accept with regret the resignation of Jessica Rasmussen from the part-time lunchroom supervisor position at Lake Middle School, effective October 25, 2024. The Board of Education approved the administrative recommendations for the following extra duty positions as outlined below. Rachel Foley and Amy Poole, 8th grade boys B basketball co-coaches. Aaron Buckland, varsity softball coach. Amy Van Zee, 8th grade girls A basketball coach. Larry Knoss, 8th grade girls B basketball coach. Amy Poole, 7th grade girls A basketball coach. Rachel Foley, 7th grade girls B basketball coach. We are approving the varsity softball coach. Yes. Okay. Next, we have the approval of September accounting for payments via member Landford. Be it resolved that the following accounts for September be approved for payment as follows: general fund accounts in the amount of two million twenty-five thousand four hundred fifty-three dollars and forty-eight cents; special revenue accounts in the amount of two hundred twenty-seven thousand six hundred eleven dollars and sixty-two cents. And be it resolved that the general fund financial statements be approved as presented. Thank you. Next, we have the acceptance and approval of gifts via member dean. <coughs> Recently, the administration was made aware of the following gifts offered by the donors listed below. Recognition and approval for acceptance of the gifts are being sought. Coldwater Noon Club and Athletic Boosters. Um, just donated a new popcorn machine to Coldwater Athletics concession stand. The value was not noted. CAF, Charities Aid Foundation, on behalf of State Farm Insurance Matching Grant, gave monetary funds to Alexis D'Alessandro, Max Larson Elementary teacher, in the amount of $222.23. Additionally, the individuals listed below have received monetary funds from the Good Better Best Grant through the Edie Klein Youth and Family Center. Ashley Miller, Jefferson Elementary teacher, $370. Zane McDonald, Lakeland Elementary teacher, $500. Brooke Fox, Max Larson Elementary teacher, $500. And Janice Storrs, BISD, on behalf of CHS Choir Program, $500. The gracious and continued support of the donors listed above is sincerely appreciated. We ask that the board accept the gifts noted and acknowledge the donors' generosity. Be it resolved that the Board of Education gratefully accept the gifts as presented. Be it further resolved that a letter of appreciation on behalf of the Board be sent to the donors indicated above for their worthwhile and generous gifts. Thank you very much. Is there a motion for the consent agenda? So moved. Second. 
Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Uh, next we have the building reports. Would the principals like to highlight any aspect of their report? Chickens. <laughs> I would like to say that I enjoyed Max Larson's to the point brief report this month. Okay. Lots of good things going on there. As I'm sure all the ones. But it was easy to read that one. Mr. Hope assured me that the kids in his school were all learning a lot. Always. <laughs> Uh, discussion items? Oh no, superintendent's report. Sorry. Superintendent, that's okay. Um, superintendent's report for this month. Uh, one of our, our big projects that we are faced with um, is a water quality management plan that is new legislation. And um, on the front end of that was the opportunity for a filter first healthy hydration grant, which will provide um, which will hopefully provide money for us to get our drinking water, uh, all of our accessible uh, potable water uh, to be up to standards. Uh, we believe they already are, but the standards that, that the state is implementing uh, raises the bar a little bit for all public schools and uh, daycare providers. Is this through Eagle? Yes, yep. So, um, so the district, um, Mr. Dancer specifically, worked very hard with with Nick uh, Canoose and Bud Sharpley to get all of the information together. And uh, so our request for that grant is to the tune of $155,562.51. Um, and we'll notify you and we'll let you know when we, we hear back on that. But um, a, a, lot of, a lot of work goes into that one. Uh, just want to reiterate the hard work that went into the countywide professional development that we po hosted on the 11th of October. Um, again, educators from all districts in the county presented on various topics. Uh, all attendees were allowed to choose which uh, sessions they wanted to go to so they could really handpick from a cafeteria style uh, menu of, of what learning they wanted for the day. And that all goes into count, uh, district provided professional development regulations that, that we have. Again, we think second year doing this, we thought it was very successful. Um, and we get really good feedback and some good constructive criticism to uh, improve for next year. So that is uh, no small task because we work on that 12 months out of the year. I think our next meeting is next week to start talking about next year. So um, we look forward to it. Uh, Aquatic Center update. We posted for the director's position. Uh, that posting ends on October 31st. And uh, just a reminder that we're working in partnership with the city throughout the selection process, that we're, uh, it's not just a school decision, but we're forming a committee to, to work on that. And then um, I wanted to apologize for the contract that you received earlier. I gave uh, Heather the wrong version, and so she uh, sent you the corrected version today, which just um, identifies the, where the money from the city is going, that they're, the 50,000 that they um, have traditionally given for operational cost will continue to be for operational cost. And then they are putting in 25,000 for um, maintenance costs. And so that delineation needed to be made. And then um, they, they're agreeing to work with us on the, the salary package for the next director. Um, so that, that should all be in there. And I apologize for any confusion that was in there prior. Uh, count day numbers are, are numbers on October 2nd were 280, or 2,864 students, which was a gain from last fall of 79 students. Again, that is kids in seats, but it doesn't necessarily equate to full-time equivalents, because if we share students with other programs, we could get less uh, of an FTE for that student depending on how much of our daily time we service those kids um, in comparison to other programs that, that would service those kids. But it's good that we've seen a gain in students. That's always a positive. Uh, and then we are finally finalizing the updates to our uh, emergency operations plan. 
and we'll meet with community first responding agencies to coordinate that when uh, the company that we're working with gives us that final draft. Uh, there's no big changes to our emergency operations plan, uh, basically updating some of the, the practices and um, some of the trainings and then identifying the new people in the new roles that, that are here in the district. So we're required to update that every other year. And uh, so we've been work actually been working with this company since May, and there's been some, some delays not on our end, um, but we hope that we're going to have this finalized by the end of next month. Thank you. Oh. And there were no board committee, committee Correct. meetings. Right. Correct. Uh, no discussion items. Next we have the action items. And the first is the request for approval and acceptance of the 2023-2024 fiscal year audit report. The school code requires the Board of Education to conduct an annual audit of the district financial records by the independent certified public accountants. Hungerford Nichols, now it's just Hungerford, isn't it? He signed Nichols it off there now? Yeah. He signed it just Hungerford. Oh yeah, it yeah, is there. There's their logo. Nichols must have died. <laughs> <laughs> or retired. Okay, retired. <laughs> the sad part is Ron said the same thing in her <laughs> Administration is re requesting board acceptance and approval of the annual audit. Be a result, the Board of Education accepts the 2023-2024 audit from Hungerford and uh, authorizes copies to be filed with the appropriate authorities. Is there a motion? So moved. Support. Any discussion? Roll call vote. Member Holbrook? Yes. Member Steele? Yes. Member Dean? Yes. Member Lamford? Yes. Member Lyon Welch? Yes. Member Frederick? Yes. Member Lake? Yes. Motion passes. Next is the request to approve the intergovernmental interlocal contract between the City of Coldwater and Coldwater Community Schools regarding the Dr. Robert W. Brown Aquatic Center and Aquatic Director. The administration has been meeting regularly with the City of Coldwater and the Dr. Robert W. Brown family to discuss the future operating expense of the Dr. Robert W. Brown Aquatic Center. The administration is requesting full board approval for the five-year intergovernmental and interlocal contract between the City of Coldwater and Coldwater Community Schools, effective January 1st, 2025. Be it resolved, the Board of Education approves the five-year intergovernmental and interlocal contract between the City of Coldwater and Coldwater Community Schools regarding the Dr. Robert W. Brown Aquatic Center, Aquatic Director, effective January 1st, 2025, as presented. Is there a motion? So moved. Or, I'd like to make a comment. Yes. Can I do that? Thank you. I want you to. I thank you. I think it's significant and also very appreciated that the Robert Brown family, if he were alive, he would be 99, because I have an aunt who went to school with him, and she's 99. But I appreciate their foundation donating over a million dollars to us over the next five years in that contract. That's significant. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to send them something. Thank you. So, I appreciate that. I have a quick Somebody question about know. the contract. Yes. Um, it talks about a, a board that's going to be created for the, um, for the Aquatic Center? Yes. How were those members selected? I know that everybody, the two seats for school, mm -hmm. two seats for city, and one seat for county, how are those selected? I don't know if there's been discussion on how that will happen. Um, we'd be happy for any thoughts. Or volunteers. <laughs> so, I, know, I think it might, wider, it's an advisory committee, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. 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 I, I, I guess make sure there's language that there's enough turnover with that board and um, that plenty of community members have a say and, and mm -hmm. have a chance to be on, on the board. I guess it would be my opinion with it. But sure. Selecting it, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, is that it? Do you have a comment? I have a question. Yeah. So under the, like where it spells out the breach of contract on page five, what is determined? I mean, is there a way to determine? It just seems a little loose where it says uh, the aquatic center is required to reasonably be available 
and consideration to impose reasonable charges. Who defines what reasonable is? Mm -hmm. if, it's, if it's something that could cause a breach of contract, I'm just wondering what, what reasonable is and who determines that. I think in the past the, the school district was given the, the full authority to do that. I think the city put that in there as a way um, to just keep it all in check and, and say if, if we're going to impose unre what, what they believe to be un unreasonable, then there needed to be some language in there. And, and I believe that came from um, both sides' attorneys, that there, that there should be some. And I think having this, um, this type of the board. board that oversees that would, would be able to address any of that. But there, there also hasn't been any talk into increasing fees or anything at this point. And some of the things about the fees is that because of the donation from the county, uh, we are going to lower all the fees for the out-of-city right. residents so that they're the same as the city residents. Yep. So, okay. I thought that was just for Coldwater Township, not for all of the precincts donating money. No, the whole county. Wow. Yeah, because, the co because the county agreed to, yep. to donate money. So, yep. Any other comments, questions? Roll call vote. Member Lyon Welch? Yes. Member Frederick? Yes. Member Lanford? Yes. Member Holbrook? Yes. Member Steele? Yes. Member Dean? Yes. Member Lake? Yes. Motion passes. Next, I need somebody's because of my computer. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Need it for all the rest. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's okay. I'll get it. Request to approve the project proposal from Sweetwater Integration for the CHS audio system. The audio system at the Coldwater High School is in need of replacement. The administration received a full project proposal from Sweetwater Integration to design and install a new PA system. The total cost of the project is $25,914.40 of which $9,252.82 will be paid from the estate donation from the CHS Music Program. Additionally, the choir boosters pay $4,769.59 toward the total cost. Remaining balance of $11,891.99 will be paid for using funds from the district's general fund account. Be it resolved, the Board of Education approves the project proposal from the Sweetwater Integration of $25,914.40 for the replacement of the audio system at Coldwater High School as presented. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Is there a condition No. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, that's a roll call vote. Oh, wait, we had a motion? Yeah. 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 Roll yeah. call vote. Member Frederick? Yes. Member Lamford? Yes. Yeah. Member Dean? Yes. Member Holbrook? Yes. Member Lyon Welch? Yes. Member Steele? Yes. Member Lake? Yes. Motion passes. Next, we have the recommendation to join the insulin lawsuit by signing the resolution and attorney client fee contract. Be it resolved, the Board of Education approves the resolution to join the insulin litigation. France Law Group out of California will be representing the districts and join the litigation be a further resolved the Board of Education also approves the attorney-client fee contract and authorizes Paul Flynn, superintendent, to sign on behalf of the district. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Do you have more information about that? Sure. Um, so what this is, is there are three main companies that have um, have had a, a lawsuit filed against them, a class action lawsuit for price gouging. Okay. And what this what this litigation is doing is trying to reclaim some of that money for employees who have spent out of pocket or insurance money, districts insurances, um, paying for those increased insulin costs. And so those individuals or the school districts could see money come back um, as a form of payment for if they win the litigation. Okay. So how does an employee's use of insulin 
that their insurance covered? So is the insurance company getting money? Is the employee getting money back, or is there? If if the employee it? had out of pocket costs, right. it would be the employee. If it's the insurance company, it would be reimbursement to the insurance company. But um, the school, it could affect the school, how much the school is paying into insurance as well. So, so okay. So if it's a, if there is something awarded, then it's on the school to determine who. So the school, the school will be work. So by signing up for this, the school will have to do some work with the insurance companies to figure out who the individuals are that could be affected by this, and the insurance companies that have that all in a report. I guess I don't understand why it wouldn't be individuals filing on their own behalf. Then what? Where does the school come into? Because they're because they're school employees under our insurance uh, premium. So that's how that's how this class action lawsuit was developed was to represent to represent school district employees across the nation. I mean, I'm all about yeah. the school district employees I just, I getting what's due to them. I just want to understand where our role is in right. that. So there's three companies who price gouged insulin. Yes, that's the, and that's the class action chart. lawsuit. Is, okay. Yeah. And we will be, as a school district, will be out and nothing. This is contingent on right. awards. Just like the just like the vape sensors and just like the social media. And where it says that, you know, they can recover fees if there is an award. That award has to be big enough to cover the fees, right? Right. The school district will be out. The school district will not it will not be out anything at all. Okay. Do you do anything about gas price gouging? <laughs> No, I haven't seen that one come across yet. So I think it's no wonder people hate lawyers. <laughs> Maybe you should go to law school. Screw that. Roll call vote. We need support. We need a, we need oh, support. we never got support? Nope. We need support. Can I support? Yes, you could. Mm -hmm. well, I don't know why you can. I don't I've, nobody's ever let me before. <laughs> Put me down. I want to support this. Okay. I love lawsuits. <laughs> so back to your business. I hate lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh now it's a roll call. <laughs> Member Steele. Yes. Member Lyon Welch. Yes. Member Frederick. Yes. Member Lambert. No. Member Holbrook. Yes. Member Dean. No. Member Lake. Yes. Uh, motion passes uh, five to two. Mm -hmm. Next, we have the recommendation to approve the revised technology services agreement with the CISD for consultation technical uh, network and data center services. The administration has been meeting with the Kelman ISD to discuss the growing need for additional technology support and to update the existing five-year contract agreement with the CISD to provide technology services for consultation technology network data services through June 30th of 2027. This will provide... It's not on this thing. This provides one more day of support. Well, they get two FTEs and one... Right here. Yes. Yeah, where we did in where technology, yeah. right, where we only had 1.8 FTE prior to this. No, oh. we're adding one more day of support. Okay. Be it resolved, the Board of Education approves the revised five-year technology services agreement for consultation technical work and data service center services with Calhoun ISD as submitted. Is there a motion? Support. Any discussion? Are they going to be located here? Yes. Like Travis was? Well, previous person. This is so. This isn't for that position. This is okay. for the two two people that we have in the buildings throughout the week. So one was one's here four days a week. Will now be here five days a week. Have we filled Travis's position? Yeah, with Berto. Oh, but, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. You know him from the high school. Yeah. Yep. So what all does this entail? That seems like a lot of money. So all of our all of our technology services, so anything related to hardware, software, online programming, firewalls, um, any any of our equipment, um, and so we have one technology director, which is Erberto, 
Um, he oversees the operations of the entire district daily operations. Anything that goes wrong, he's our, our frontline person. He, um, this is all through Calhoun ISD, so these are Calhoun ISD employees. Um, so he works along with the Calhoun ISD technology department to make sure that all of our firewalls are up to date, all of our, all, everything that we're required to have by law is up to date. And um, some of my uh, emails to you have talked about how we're looking at um, increasing like dual, uh, dual authentication every time you log in and, and those type of um, stops to any type of hacking or any type of ransomware. Um, and then what we have had in the district are two other workers that work in the buildings to address, so, you know, if something happens in a teacher's classroom or if something happens in a building, they're more hands-on. They also work with the repair of Chromebooks. Um, there's a whole plethora of things they do. And so we had one working five days a week, one working four days a week. Um, there was a need in another district to increase um, to increase service where the one person that we had four days a week would go to that other district for the fifth day. But since they were increasing, um, they asked if we, if we wanted to go from 1.8 FTE or full-time equivalent staff in the buildings to 2.0. 2 so two full-time here in the district and not one person jumping ship every, every day of the week. So, mm -hmm. Any other? Can, uh, one thing I just wanted to add, that cost just doesn't cover those three. That covers all of the support that CISD provides as well from their end. So it's not just those three individuals, but the entire program. Roll call vote. Uh, Member Lanford? Yes. Member Dean? Yes. Member Steele? Yes. Member Frederick? Yes. Member Holbrook? Yes. Member Lyon Welch? Yes. yes. Member Lake? Yes. So that action item passes. We're going to go back to the insulin lawsuit because I can't second a motion. So According to Robert's rule of order, I, I had a hunch after I said. <clears throat> after I, you said yes? You I, said, after I said I didn't see why not, and then it, I, I have thought a copy about of Robert's that. Robert's rule. Yeah, yeah Robert's here. rule of order says board president cannot I, okay. second a motion. Recommendation to join the insulin lawsuit by signing. The resolution and attorney client fee contract. Is there a motion? So moved. Mm -hmm. That's the first one. Right. <laughs> yes. We just need support. I, I can't ask one more question yet, right? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Sure. So this money goes back to the employees. Yes. Yes. So it's just us going, signing on to, if anything comes back, we will then figure out what the employees were out and they could. It, it benefits our employees. Yes. Okay. How are those employees are sure? going to know that this is available? That's our job. When I say our job, I mean the business office's job. There's How much work is that? Well, the insurance company should be able to provide that information, number one. Mm -hmm. And number two, there's very few people that are listed that will have access to that. And so it will only be him and I that will have access to that information. Okay. <clears throat> Support? Yes, I'm just, yep. <laughs> Is that a question or a, <laughs> yeah, it's a little of both. Support. It's a support question or a statement mm -hmm. or both. I support our employees getting any money that is due them. Okay. Yes. All right. And we're confident well, that's, that's the way we can sue on behalf of somebody else. Yeah. Maybe well, that's fine. It, I mean, it just seems like it's difficult. I know. It's a little bit Okay, roll call vote. Okay, so we'll roll call again. Member Steele? Yes. Member Lyon Welch? Yes. Member Frederick? Yes. Member Lanford? No. Member Holbrook? No. Member Dean? No. And Member Lake? Well, Chief. <laughs> this is terrible. That's why you get the have a close session. <laughs> yes. 
Motion passes, four to three. Next, we have the announcements and comments. The next regular meeting of the Board of Education will be held on Monday, November 25th, 2024, at 6 o'clock in the evening at the Administrative Service Center located at 401 Sauk River Drive in Coldwater. I have a question. Don't slam. I have a question. I don't want you to end the meeting yet. What, this is the fall, mm -hmm. or any, any administrator, what behavior supports do we have K-12 in this district for our students who are need it? So we have counselors in each building. We have uh, the 31N grant provides for social workers in the building. Okay. Um, that is, to, is um, presenting itself to be a challenge because um, the, since every school district and every agency like the ISD gets 31N money mm -hmm. and there's only so many social workers to go around. Um, it's difficult when, when one leaves us to find another. Um, but we have the counselors, we have social workers, we have behavior support uh, staff in some of our buildings. Do we have a program, K-12, that... I know, I know at Jefferson, they're on TV. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just the, the big umbrella is the positive behavior intervention of the courts okay. yeah. is the, the what we're required to by the state is to use something that's positive behavior okay. fact. Um, but we have to have our, our menu of consequences um, that's established. Can you do this, this happens. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. This yeah, code of conduct. Yeah. Yeah. Is that I won't don't want to put you on the spot. Okay. Any of you. Um, how do teachers buy into that program? It's team driven. Okay. So teachers are on the team, okay. um, well represented. Um, ideally, we should have parents on the team, mm -hmm. students on the team. Um, but that's one of the PBIS tier one um, asks. Okay. Um, it's hard to get to that point to have that diverse a team, but it, it's yeah. definitely very well represented by staff. Okay, thank you. And there's also, um, at, at the lower levels, there's also um, student need meetings, student need and child study meetings mm -hmm. meeting here where, where the team will get together and talk about individual students and, and talk about any um, additional supports those kids okay. may have. Thank you. So, okay. I know all schools are dealing with this, yes. so I, as well as uh, our schools. Sign in yet? We're not yeah. the only ones. Yep. Thank you. Okay, President Blake, you can end the meeting if you want to, or you can continue to talk. <laughs> what are you going to talk about? Anything? I don't care. Gas prices. Right. We're adjourned. <laughs>